I'm Jenna. Um, I'm the leader of the small group of the seniors who dominated today, <laughs> despite any cheating that might have occurred. I don't know what Ben's talking about. Um, it's good to be with you guys. I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to teach tonight. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to be with you guys. And we're going to be talking today a little bit um, further in Colossians. We're going to cover First Coloss or Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Um, but before we do that, I just want to take a moment to back up and just kind of review a little bit of where we've come from. And so who can give us, I mean, we're now 15 verses in, who can give us some things that we have learned from verse 1 to verse 14 of Colossians? Shout it out if you have something. What is something you have learned so far? Say that louder. To forgive. To forgive. Okay. We talked about forgiveness. I think that was maybe week one of Colossians. Ben has no idea what day it is, so he's just going to nod to anything we say today. <laughs> what else did we talk about so far with Colossians? We talked about forgiveness in week one. What else? Leah, did you have something? No. <laughs> about bad habits. Yeah. How to fix bad habits. Yeah. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Let's start there. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul. Who was he writing to? The church in Colossia, is that what you said? The good? Okay, and what was his purpose for writing the letter? Why is he writing to them? Does anyone remember that from our very first week? Why does he write to the Colossians? What do you think? Yeah, to commend them for how well they're doing, to encourage them. This is a letter of encouragement. There's other letters that Paul writes that are kind of full of correction, and that's not really what we see here. All right, last week, you guys talked about two kingdoms, and Ben talked about that there was two different kingdoms that you can be part of. What were those two kingdoms that you talked about last week? The kingdom of, kingdom of light and the kingdom of... Darkness. Okay, so you talk about the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So we remember last week. That's good. That's a plus. So the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And Ben kind of presented the idea of like what kingdom are you in and what does your life show that you are living in? So if you are a member of the kingdom of light, does your life show that you are living in that kingdom? And I want you to go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Whoever gets there first, if you can shout out a page number for us so we know... What was it? 805? Okay. Thank you. 804. Okay. Open up to the book of Colossians. We're going to start with chapter 1. And I want to start by rereading verse 14 because any time that we are reading the Bible, we want to make sure that we know what came before, before we go forward. We want to make sure that we are reading in context. And so verse 14, where we ended last week, said this, for he, meaning God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Okay, so that's where we ended last week. So we have been brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom that is ruled by the son he loves. And now we're going to go into the next five verses this week. And this whole thing is going to be about the supremacy of of this son. And so Paul is going to go on for the next five verses and talk about this son, Jesus, and why he is supreme over everything. Okay, so why he is supreme over everything. And the very first thing that we're going to see as we dive into this is that Jesus is going to have authority over creation. Okay, that Jesus is going to have authority over creation. So most of you guys know that I have four kids, four girls actually. They're pretty close in age. And when you have like kids that close in age and probably just like kids in general, it's just inevitable that they're going to fight, right? How many of you have fights with your siblings? Yeah. If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably lying. I think you probably do. But one of the most common fights 
that my girls have. Anyone have a guess over what my girls fight over the most? Clo I heard it. Toys. Like things. Could be clothes if they were older. They're not there yet. Things. Okay, so one of my biggest pet peeves is when my kids get a new toy and the very first question that they ask me is, do I have to share this? Like, do I have to share this toy? And so my girls have this common thing where they lose patience with a sibling because they're playing with a toy that they think belongs to them. But the reality is, is most likely my kid did not buy or purchase that toy, right? It probably came from somebody else, maybe me or a grandma or something like that. But that's not the only thing my kids fight over. They fight over other things as well, like their space. They share a room, and one of the other common things they fight over is like if a sibling gets on one of their beds. I don't know why that is such an issue for them, but if a sibling gets on a bed, it's like a meltdown occurs. And they also, probably about like once a month, try to divide the room in half and say like, okay, like this side of the room is yours, and to get to the door, you have to go like this, and you can't step on this space, right? My kids really want exclusive rights to their stuff right? That's what's really at the root of all of their fights. They want to call their things mine, right? They want to own them. They want control and authority over their things. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a moment in your life where things feel out of control, or if you've ever felt like you wanted more authority over things that you thought were yours. Maybe you can relate to what my kids have experienced or to their frustrations of feeling like they don't have control over their space. We all experience circumstances in life where it feels like no matter what we do, we can't really grasp for control of the things that we want. And if you haven't been there yet, you're going to be eventually. There will be a time where you want control over something and you just can't get it. And the reason that we feel like that is that really the, the reality is, is that there are times where we really don't have the power that we like to think we have. Because you and I are created creatures. We are not the creator. And so sometimes, as created creatures, there are things that are out of our control. Our text today in Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20 um, we're going to read, and we're going to see as we read through this text, the word all and every, over and over and over again. And I'm going to emphasize that as we read, because Paul is going to be trying to make a very clear point as we read this. He wants to make the claim that Jesus is supreme over all, over everything. And so we're going to be reminded today that Jesus is concerned with every aspect of his creation, every inch of his created world, and every single creature that is in it. And we're going to be reminded that there is not an inch in this world that Jesus does not yell mine over. But unlike my daughters, who try to like stake claims over things that don't really belong to them, Jesus has the authority to make that claim. So let's go ahead and dig into Colossians. I'm going to read for us Colossians 15 to 17. And again, we're going to see this claim here that Jesus has authority over creation. So beginning in verse 15, it says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All right, so Paul begins this text by reminding the Colossians, first of all, that, Je that Jesus is supreme and that he has authority over all creation. And the reason that Paul says that Jesus has authority over creation is that Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. So that is the first thing on your notes there. So I want to talk about this idea of Jesus being the image of God. In fact, Paul says that he is the image of the invisible God. And so like, let that sink in for a moment. Jesus is the image of God. In other areas of the Bible, it says he's the exact representation of his being. 
So God, who we cannot see with our eyes, who is invisible, right? As a kid, do you remember thinking that? Like, I can't see God. That's a question my kids often ask. Like, where is he? I can't see him. You say he is with me, but I can't see him. So God, who is invisible, wanted to make himself known to us, and so he sent Jesus. So if we want to know what God is like, if we want to know what he thinks, what he cares about, what is important to him, we need to look to the life of Jesus. In the Gospel of John, Thomas asks Jesus a question. He asks Jesus to show him what the Father is like. And Jesus responds in John 14, 9. He says, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus makes God known. And if we stop and just ponder this, this is an incredibly gracious act in the first place because God is transcendent. He is holy. He is beyond what we can comprehend. And if you think of any other God that people worship, like people don't understand those gods and they don't try to understand them. They're too holy to understand. But the God that we worship sent his son so that we could understand him. The reason why he wants us to know him is because he wants to be in relationship with us. That's an amazing thing. You cannot be in a relationship with somebody you don't know. Think about the people who are important in your life. Think about the people who know you. They know your secrets They know what you think and how you feel. They probably know what you're thinking before you even speak because they know the insides of you that other people don't know. That is what it means to be in relationship with somebody. And this is what God has done for us with Jesus. God sent his son so that we can know what God is like We talk all the time about how God sent his son to die for us and to save us, and that is definitely an amazing aspect of why God sent Jesus. But sometimes we gloss over the fact that God sent Jesus just so we can know what God is like. Jesus is the exact image of God. And we can also be an image of God, not an exact one, right? None of us are exactly like God, like Jesus is, but we can represent him too. We can show others his goodness, his love, We can show others his mercy. We are made in the image of God, but we show that love to others when our hearts are transformed by Jesus. So the second way that Paul says that Jesus has authority over creation is Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn of creation, Paul says Jesus is the firstborn of creation. So I want to talk about this term firstborn because it's kind of a weird thing. It's like the idea of Jesus being created, it almost sounds like, like he was born. But let's talk about this because when Paul says firstborn, what he means here is first in status or holding the highest place. Okay, he's not saying that Jesus was created because we're going to see in just another section here that Paul talks about Jesus being the creator. So he's not saying Jesus was created. And that's really an important distinction because in the time that Paul was writing, there were lots of people who were making the claim that Jesus was not fully God. And so that is not what Paul is saying here. What Paul means by firstborn is that Jesus holds the highest status. So in ancient Roman culture, the firstborn son would have had been the one to inherit the family fortune, right? He was the one who got the highest status. And so when Paul makes a claim that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, what he is actually saying is Jesus is the one who's going to inherit all of creation. He is the one who will inherit the world. Then Paul goes on to explain why Jesus is the one who's going to inherit the world. In verse 16, he says, For in him all things were created. So how can Jesus be the one to inherit or be the firstborn of creation? Well, because he made it, right? He made it all. And that's the next thing that we see here, that Jesus created all things. He created all things. Jesus made everything, and because Jesus made everything, then everything belongs to him, right? If you think about a painter who makes, like, a beautiful masterpiece, 
after a painter makes a masterpiece, the rights of that painting belong to him because he was a creator of it. And so that is exactly what Paul is saying here. He's saying Jesus owns the rights to creation, so to the world and to everything in it. And Paul then lists all the things that Jesus created. And essentially we see that he created both the material things, the things that we see, and then also the spiritual world as well. And so he created the heavens and he created the earth. He created the visible and he created the invisible too. All of them were created by him and all of them are now his. We see um, in the gospel stories, if you read the gospels, that Jesus has authority over all different types of things. Okay, we see that he stops the wind and water when he's on the Sea of Galilee. Do you remember that story? When the disciples, when Jesus is sleeping and the disciples are in the middle of a storm and he wakes up and is able to calm the waters. He has authority over the wind and the water. We see that he has authority over demons. So over the spiritual world, he is able to cast out demons. We see that he has authority over disease, that he can heal people. And then finally, we also see that he has authority over death, that he has the ability to conquer death. And so our rightful response to somebody who has authority over all of those things, our rightful response to somebody who has created the world and who has created us is worship and obedience. We are his created creatures, and we are created to worship him. And not only is Jesus the beginning of all creation, but he's also the creation's destiny as well. Paul ends this section by saying, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Paul is saying here that it is through Jesus that all things are created, right? And notice that he, Paul doesn't say that like Jesus made creation and then just turned it loose and doesn't do anything all anymore. It says he holds it together. And so what is Paul is saying here is that Jesus is the one who keeps the world in order. He is the one who keeps the stars in place. He's the one who keeps the world spinning. He is the one who keeps creation going. Without Jesus, it would be chaos. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, we see that in Genesis, that is actually what is happening. If you look at the first pages of Genesis, we see that the world is empty, that it's formless, that it's essentially chaotic. But then as creation starts to happen, it becomes orderly. And we, so we see that if it were not for Jesus, that's what we would experience. It would be complete chaos. Now I want to think for a minute about Jesus' birth when Jesus took on flesh, our creator, the creator of the world, entered into the world that he created through one of his human beings that he created. Like, it's kind of mind-boggling when you stop to think about it. And so Jesus, the creator, allowed Mary, his mother, who he created, to feed him, to care for him, to take care of him. And he, he depended on her, right? He was fully human at the same time. But at the same time that he was fully human and needed her to feed him, he was also fully God and was like holding the stars in place in the sky. Like that's an incredible thing to try to grapple with. Jesus holds all of creation together. So now Paul is going to transition us to a new idea he says not only does Jesus have authority over creation, the world that we see around us, but Jesus also has authority over the new creation. Okay, so Jesus has authority over the new creation, and we're going to look at what we mean by this word, new creation. Let's go ahead and take a look at verses 18 through 20. Colossians 18 says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Paul begins this next section by showing us that not only is Jesus creator of the physical world we see, 
but he is also creator of a new creation. And what is the new creation that Paul is talking about? What do you think he means by a new creation? What is the new creation? What was it? You're close. What is the new creation that Jesus started? What do you think? Any other thoughts? Paul, sometimes, sometimes we hear that we are the new creation. Have you ever heard that in the Bible? You are a new creation. The new creation that Paul is talking about here is the church. It's us, right? Then Jesus does a work in our hearts when he changes our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. We are said to be a new creation. And so we see that Jesus is the head of, of the new creation or the church. So Paul begins by saying that Jesus is the head of the body. And when Paul says head, what he means here is he is the source of it. Okay, so we see that Jesus is the source or Jesus is the head of the church. Okay, Jesus is the head of the church. And we're going to see Paul repeat some of the same ideas here. And the first thing that Paul repeats is he repeats this idea about Jesus being the firstborn. But now Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead, which sounds really kind of weird and gruesome. He says he's the firstborn of the dead. And basically what Paul is saying here is that the agent of this new creation is death. Let me just say it this way. So like the grave, okay, the grave was like the womb from which the new creation came right? It is because of Jesus's resurrection and death that we have a new creation or the church. If it was not for the grave, if it was not for the tomb, we would not have the church. Now, you might be thinking like, okay, Jesus is the firstborn of the new creation, but Jesus wasn't the first one who was resurrected, right? We have Bible stories where people were resurrected like Lazarus, but the difference is is that Lazarus died again, right? He was basically resuscitated until he died another death, however many other years that took. We don't know. But Jesus is the first one to have victory over death. And so because of that, because of we are part of Jesus' family, because we are part of his body, of his church, we are also able to have victory over death as well. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Paul goes on to explain why he is the firstborn of the dead. Paul says that it is so that in everything he might have supremacy. Okay, in everything he might have supremacy. So we're going to get this idea here that Jesus is the head over all of the church. Now, my preschooler um, goes to preschool here at Pathway Preschool. And Ms. Maddie, shout out to you, Ms. Riley. Do we have any other preschool teachers here? Just you two, right? She goes to church here, or to school here at church, and last week she informed me that there was a kid in her classroom who was throwing toys, okay? And she was all fired up about it. Of course it was a boy, right? Like boys are like, you know, just can't not throw toys. And she marched up to him, being like the kid that she is, she marched up to this little boy and informed him that she was going to tell, his, tell her mom about what he was doing and that he better watch out because her mom ran the whole church, yeah, I have major power, apparently. So she came to me and told me this, and I kind of, like, regretfully informed her, like, actually, like, I'm not in charge of the church. And so she asked, like, well, who is? Because she wanted to go find that person instead and let them know what this little boy was doing. And I responded to her, and I said, well, Jesus is the head of the church. To which Lydia said, well, someone has to speak for Jesus. So now the thing is, it's kind of funny when my toddler thinks that Jesus is the head of the church, like we can laugh about that. Or when my, my toddler thinks that people are the head of the church, we laugh about that. But we do the same thing, don't we? We have a tendency to want to idolize people in the church, to put leaders up on pedestals or to make them more important than they really are. We have a tendency to worship people. And worship the things that God has gifted them with. Whether we idolize somebody because they're a good speaker or because they're an amazing singer or because they have a gift that we wish that they had. Instead, what is ironic is that we are worshiping created people who have, been, have gifts that are given to them by God rather than worshiping 
the one that those gifts and those people are meant to point us to. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the firstborn of the whole new creation, a creation that can transcend death because he did it first. We who are, are part of the body of Christ can have victory over death, but only because he did it first. And part of the reason that we as a new creation can transcend death is because God's fullness dwelt in Jesus. God's fullness dwelt in Jesus. Paul tells us in this verse that God was pleased for his fullness to dwell in Jesus. So I want to think about this idea of God's fullness for just a minute because this is kind of a weird term. But we see several places in the Bible where God's fullness dwelt with the people of Israel. We see it in Mount Sinai when Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. We're told that the fullness of God came down onto the mountain. And it was like it came down and there was like thunder and lightning. And the people of Israel stood back and they trembled with fear. Okay, that was the fullness of God that the people witnessed. We're told that God's fullness was in the tabernacle and in the temple. But then, like, people couldn't get in to the tabernacle or the temple. Only one person could go in, like, once a year. And there was all kinds of rules and regulations about what that person had to do to be able even to enter into the place where God's fullness dwelt. But we're told that the Son had the fullness of God in the form of a body. One body encapsulated all of God's glory. And again, like we have to stop to ponder that for a minute. As wonderful as our bodies are, and I don't want to shame our bodies because our bodies are good, but our bodies are also flawed, right? They're limited. There are times where our bodies don't do what we want them to do. There's times when our bodies aren't really that glorious, but it is here that we are told that God was pleased to have his glory, his fullness, dwell. Finally, Paul tells us that because God's glory was in Jesus, he tells us that Jesus can reconcile us with God. Jesus can reconcile us with God. So not only is Jesus the creator of the earth, of the old creation, and not only is he the creator of the new creation or the church, but through the fullness of Jesus, things are reconciled between him or between God our Father and his creation or us. Jesus brings peace between God and man. And how did this happen? How did this reconciliation occur? Well, Paul tells us that the reconciliation happens through his blood. And so anytime we see that word blood, what Paul is kind of saying to us is it happens because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because of Jesus' death and because of his resurrection, we are reconciled with God. The story of the Bible is all about the reunification of heaven and earth. If you go all the way back to the very opening pages of Genesis, the very, very first problem that we have is that there is a split between God and his creation. When sin enters the world, now all of a sudden the creator and creation are not in harmony anymore. There is no longer peace. There is separation. And so the entire storyline of the Bible seeks to answer the question of how is creation going to be able to be with its creator again, right? Anyone reminded of Sun Zone here? So Paul ends this section by saying that there is now peace. There is peace between God's creation and its creator because Jesus died and overcame the power of death and brought resurrection and peace to his new creation. Through his death, through Jesus' death, a dying world was reconciled to a living God. These five verses are all about the supremacy of Jesus. We see here that Jesus has authority over both the old creation, the world he created, and the new creation, which is our church. We see that Jesus is the one for whom both of these creations exist. We as a church exist for Jesus. The world was created for Jesus. We also see that he's the one who's going to inherit all of it. 
He will inherit the world, and he's going to be the one who inherits the church. And he is also the head of both. We see that without Jesus, we wouldn't have a world, and we wouldn't have a church. And we also can see that we wouldn't be able to sustain either one. We can't sustain creation by ourselves, and we also can't sustain the church by ourselves either. He is Lord of all. When we think about the supremacy of Jesus, we can see that he is creator, he is infinite, and he is perfectly in control of the things that he created. Jesus is supreme, but we are not. Jesus is perfectly in control of the universe. We are not. We are created creatures who were created to be dependent upon our Savior. But if you're like me, then you might be one who is constantly grasping for control of things that you don't really have control over. Jesus is sovereign. I am not. But if I'm honest with myself and if I'm honest with you, I would say that I am probably a lot more like my kids than I want to admit. I want control over things in my life. I want control over my circumstances. I want control over my things. I might not appear as childish as my kids in yelling mine over toys and clothes, but it's essentially what I'm doing, right? I want to be king over my little world. I want things to go my way in the way that I think is best. But as a child of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the rightful response of a created Christian believer is not to yell, mine, but to humbly bow in obedience to the one who created everything to rightly recognize our role as created beings and to worship the one who created it all and to trust that he has better control over it than we do. We've been talking this entire series about a question. You've been asked again and again that if you believe that Jesus is enough, what changes? Right? The title of our series is Sufficient. If you believe that Jesus is enough, what changes? And so I'm going to ask you that question again, but change it just a little bit. If you believe that Jesus is supreme over everything, if you really believe that, then what changes? And so I want to give us a little bit of time to think about that. There's a reflection question that you have at the top of your page there. And the for reflection question, I'm going to give you some time to ponder that. It asks you this. It says, think about the magnitude of Jesus' supremacy and ask yourself, where do you grasp for control and authority in life that should be given over to God? I'm going to give you some time to think about that, and then I will pray for us, and we will move quietly into small groups. So go ahead and pray over that question and jot down some ideas that you might have. I'm going to close us in prayer, and I'm going to be dismissing us to small groups. If you'd bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. We confess, Lord, that we often try to get control over things that are not ours to try to get control over. We admit that we like to think of ourselves as having some type of control over our lives or some type of authority over things, but when, the, when it comes to it, Lord, we do not. And so we confess our need for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he created us. We thank you that you love us enough that you sent your son so that we might know who you are. We thank you that because of Jesus, we are reconciled with you and we can be at peace with our Heavenly Father. I pray for us, Lord, as we move into small group time, I pray, Lord, that it would be a wonderful time of fellowship, that there would be moments of laughter. I pray that there would be moments of honesty and vulnerability. And I also pray that we would learn from each other. We thank you so much for this time together, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.